Yeah, we know times are tough, but what are you yoking up with? Demons? Yoga? Witchcraft? Tarot? What are you doing? This is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online every Saturday, 12, 15 p.m. Pacific Time. And we want to let you know that God is watching our lives. He's very much in tune with us. He knows that life brings all kind of curves, dips, detours, delays, blockages, all kind of stuff. But he is in control and he wants us to be ready when he comes. And there are a lot of things in life that we have to travel through. Some of us have to go through rainstorms, snowstorms, blizzards. We have to go through drought. We have to go through the heat of the summer. We have to go through the dark of the night. Whatever the case is, God will bring us out on the other end unscathed, but we have to go through his way, not ours. So this is what I want you to listen to. We're going to start we want to start with a few things that we must do. We're going to list the things that we have to do as we go. I'm just kind of following how I feel led right now. One of the things that can wreak havoc in our lives, when we're trying to prepare for the rapture, we're trying to prepare for the second coming, we're trying to prepare to be taken to heaven and nowhere else. We have to guard our hearts, guard our minds, and, or, and order our steps. So we have to ask God to order our steps. Amen? So one way that God orders our steps is in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he tells us in verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? Now, let me share this real quick. We're going to go this step by step. So please be patient with me because I'm really trying to follow what I believe God is leading me to do. And, you know, we all know in part, see in part, hear in part. So I know I'm not getting the full picture because I'm getting it in part. But I pray that the biggest part is what he's giving me right now. And sometimes I go through those moments of self-doubt. So I want you to hear this. Verse 14 that says, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. We don't realize that we are yoking up with unbelievers, not only by hanging out at the bar with the buddy down the street. We're not only hanging out with unbelievers when we're in the bed with some unsaved partner and we're out there committing fornication or we're out there committing adultery or we're out there getting high or we're getting drunk or we're doing what we shouldn't do or we're cheating uh, somebody out of their money or we're stealing together or whatever. That's not the only way of being unequally yoked. Listen to this. Some of you are born again Christians and you love the music that Beyonce puts out. Some of you are born again Christians and you are looking for the politicians to save the day. Some of you are born again Christians and you're putting all of your store, all of your hope, all of your faith in human beings to come and, and bring a change. But guess what? God is the only one. that He can appoint people, but whatever changes take place that make things better in our lives, that comes from God. If people are used by God to make things better, they are being used and appointed by God. They're being anointed by God to succeed in what he wants to accomplish through them for our sake. So don't put your faith, your hope, your trust, tie up your time, your entertainment in things that are diametrically opposed to the ways of God. If you're living, if you're listening to music like, if loving you is wrong, I don't want to do right. 
That is diametrically opposed to God's ways. If you're sitting up there on the porch with your buddies while they're puffing and, and snorting and sucking and drinking and doing cussing and talking loud, saying nothing, and they're, they're all about nothing and everything they're about is glorifying sin, you should not be sitting up there with them laughing and joking. If you want to be with an unsaved person, your goal should be to draw them close to the Lord. So what you do is you bring them into your circle on your terms, on your turf where God's presence abides. You don't sit and hang out on the devil's turf with de with the devil's people, with the devil's ways and laugh and qua qua about what's going on. See, we don't realize how we damper, how we contaminate what God has put in our lives by the things we yoke up with. Talking about yoking, it's coming to my mind right now. Some of you are so into yoga, it's ridiculous. You know the poses in yoga more than you know God's word. Trying to get your body in shape. What happened to regular old exercise or good old hard work? What happened to that? But listen, for some of you who don't know this, and I'm going step by step so you kind of get what I'm talking about. God is getting ready to bust through them clouds any minute. The rapture is going to happen. Where will you be when that happens? If you're sitting there participating in yoga, yoga means yoking up. With idol gods. That's what it means. Every position yoga takes is I is yoking you up with idol gods. You open up a portal for demonic activity when you step over onto the devil's turf. If you look at the Hinduism, you listen to the East Indians who have left that for Christ, they begin to expose what those movements mean. Leave it alone, y'all. Go to a gym and, 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 and get involved with, with the, uh, the weights and the dances and whatever, but leave that yoga alone. You have no idea what you're opening up to. And all that crazy chanting some of you do, you don't know what you're yoking up with. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. See, when the Bible says, how can righteousness mix with unrighteousness? How can communion have light? with darkness how can in it what communion does light have with darkness it's it's that they're diametrically opposed you cannot straddle the fence you cannot have it both ways and you have to remember while you're preparing for that big day while you're preparing for eternity you have to remember God's word says, I am holy. Be ye holy, for God is holy. Holy does not mean you do what you want to do uh, seven, uh, six days a week, and on one day a week, you do what God wants you to do. That's not holy. That's religion and it's hypocrisy. You must be, not just do. Because when you be, you will do what God wants you to do. If you're being a true follower of God. Let, okay, let's move on. I don't want to I don't want to belabor the issue. Let's go on to 2 Corinthians. We're still in chapter 6. So I want you to scroll down with me. Let me see. All right. Verse 16. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols. For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now listen to this. Imagine this. This is coming to my, to my mind. I always ask God to give me examples. Imagine. <laughs> and 15 says, of what concord hath Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Listen, imagine you're sitting in a church. I mean, we got to put it in church terms because a lot of you, 
you lose sight of being the temple of God. So you have to see that building in order to, for you to picture what we're trying to say. Picture a church, church building. You know, let's go all the way to the building, you know, brick and mortar. That's not the, that's not the church. It's a building. The church is you and me. But let's look at a building for now. It makes it easier for some of you. You're in a building, you're in the church, sitting in a pew, you're praying, you're talking to the Lord. And then somebody comes in with a bunch of their friends and they start ha uh, putting on a show for each other. What are they doing? They're having a strip tease in the church. Strip tease. Now, you would be mortified to see somebody come and desecrate the, the, the temple that way, wouldn't you? You would be mortified to see folks coming in there with their crack pipes and their, and their beer cans, and they're just making a mess of the church, and they're tossing the trash from, from eating their snacks all over the floor, and they're, they're, they're desecrating the whole building, right? That's the way you see it. But what you don't see is when God's looking at you in your body, which is the true temple of God, and you are allowing all this crap from TV, all these nasty songs from music about bees and hoes and shaking it and baking it and whooping it up and bending over and sucking it up and all of that, and you're taking that and shaking your booty to the music. You're doing the exact same thing that you see in your mind in that church where people are doing a strip tea show in the church building. You're doing the exact same thing, only it's worse because you are the living temple of God. You are opening your ear gate, your eye gate. You're opening your spirit up to stuff. That's why when God says, touch not the unclean thing, that's what he means. You're not to delve into witchcraft. You're not to delve into the occult. You are not to delve into all kind of sexual orgies. You are not to delve into uh, getting high any way you can. You are not to delve into a uh, child molestation. You are not to, to dapper into rape. You are not to get it caught up into pornography. You are not to get caught up in violence. Some of you men, I'm, I'm wrapping up what God has given me in scripture. I feel like that's the way he wants me to go. If you want to be a bishop, you should never be a striker. That means you don't whoop your wives behind. You don't beat up on your husband. You don't abuse your kids and chain them up and stick them in the, in the cellar and don't feed them for days. Do you hear what I'm saying? You don't use your words to kill your kids or your spouse. You'll never amount to anything. Why don't you just drop dead? You're good for nothing, so-and-so. I hate you. I wish you would die so I could go on and live my... I shouldn't have had you kids in the first place. You just messed my life up. Whoa. And a lot of you calling on the name of Jesus are literally desecrating the little temples that God has put under your care, those children. And you are demasculating and, and, and degrading your spouse, putting them down, devaluing them, disrespecting them in public, hitting them whatever you get a bad attitude or you get a pimple on your spirit, you decide you're going to take it out on them physically. No. All right. Mm. Romans chapter five. Go with me there. Romans chapter five. Oh, all I got to do is click it. <laughs> Woo. Romans chapter five. Let's see. There it is. Okay, therefore, starting at verse 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith 
into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Listen, listen, listen. If you are justified by faith, if you are full of God's peace, if your heart is shed abroad with his love, why are you mistreating one another? Why is there so much wrath? Why are there so many arguments? Why are you backstabbing and backbiting your brothers and sisters in Christ? Why are you telling their business and, and, and blasting all their privacy out on the streets so everybody can get a good laugh? Why are you sitting there in the corner whizzy whizzy and, and, and you and your buddies are just waiting for that me messenger of God to fall flat on their face because you don't like them? Because you think that they think they're all that in a bag of chips. When God gave them that confidence, no, is that you think they're all that in a bag of chips and it threatens you. So you put them down in front of your friends so you can make yourself look better. Baby, it doesn't work like that. One, one of those things God hates. Those that sow discord among brethren. What is a person that sows discord? A person that blasts, that slanders, that tells all kind of gossip and lies to break up friendships, to, to kill somebody's faith in someone else, to make somebody dislike somebody they were loving and adoring. That's a sower of discord. Many of you do that and you don't even realize it. And you think when the rapture comes, you're going to shoot up like a bullet. Mm -mm. You're going to sit there like dead weight right on the ground with the rest of the sinners calling on the name of Jesus. Lord, what about me? What about me? What about me? And what about you? See, I'm going to tell you right now, when I read the scripture, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace, the grace of God wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of glory of God. That right there almost brought tears to my eyes because I think there's a burden on God's heart. For those of you who don't live in peace, but you feed off of strife. For those of you who don't live by faith, no, you got, you're, you're a control freak. You got to handle everything your way. You got to tell them off and put her in her place and slap him down and, and knock them to the ground and ruin their reputation. And you're going to get them told. You're going to make sure they know who you are. They ain't never going to forget you because you're going to let them know what's up. That's not God's way. That kind of stuff breaks God's heart to see people treating each other that way. And you think you're getting ready for the rapture. Okay. Verse six, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And you won't mortify the deeds of your flesh out of the love for one another. You won't shut your mouth and bite your tongue out of love. But Christ died when we were yet sinners. And you got brothers and sisters in Christ under the blood like where you're supposed to be. And you're treating them like crap. You're treating them like trash. And you think God's going to wink at that. Well, God understands. Uh, back that track up and look at that once again. Compare it to the word of God, because that's not God's way. These are the things that can hinder you, that can block your 
your rite of passage into the heavenly of heavenlies, into the holy of holies. That will block your passage. That will block your connection with God. Why? Because you're opening yourself up to demonic activity. You know, a demon of wrath, a demon of bitterness, a demon of strife or violence, they cannot be satisfied. They are in agonizing torture. You hear me? Unless they find a vessel they can express themselves in. And when you open your mouth wide and show your little narrow behind in public at someone else's expense, you have allowed, you have come into agreement. You have yoked up with demons just like yoga yokes up with idol, demon, demonic gods. That's right. When you yoke yourself up with demons, your mouth becomes a toilet bowl. Your mouth becomes a trash can. Your heart has got to be full of toxins, full of bitterness, full of rage, full of anger. And because you're not operating by faith, you're operating by demonic control. Why? Because by faith, you have to go to God. By faith, you have to humble yourself. By faith, you have to obey him. And if you're not willing to sacrifice your rights, your emotions, your feelings, your attitudes, your freedom of speech to obey God, you are not living by faith. And without faith, without faith, it is impossible to please him. All right, Second Timothy, Second Timothy, chapter three. All right, now here we're back to this again. And I just feel like we're going to, we're just going to tap dance on this a little bit. For those of you men who have no control over your emotions, for those of you women who have no control over yours, and you guys as adults have adult temper tantrums, and you break windows, and you crash cars, and you slap your kids up against the wall, and you knock your woman or your husband upside the wall, upside the head, you take a frying pan or baseball bat, your feet, your fist, you don't care. You will hurt somebody. Listen, this is a true saying. If a man desired to the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, not one wife and five girlfriends, or one wife and one girlfriend, or one wife and a lightweight affair. No, the husband the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, hmm, got your act together, of good behavior, given to hospitality, hospitality, apt to teach, which means if you're a man, you ought to be willing to take some good advice from your wife, your help me. If you're a woman, you ought to be able to listen to good advice from your husband. Three, not given to wine. Not no striker. There, there we go with the fist, the baseball bat, the temper tantrums. Not greedy, a filthy luger, but patient. Not a brawler. Not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children and subjecting with all gravity. Listen, number three. What came to my mind when I said not a brawler, not covetous. Listen, some of you, you have a wife or you have a husband. They're yours. You're one in the spirit, but you act like you own them. They can't talk to a member of the opposite sex. Or you're going to have a hissy fit and they're going to get a butt whooping. They can't be looked at by a man or a woman of the opposite sex. People look at people all the time, but you ain't having it because that belongs to you. No, baby, you both belong to Christ. You are not to lord over God's heritage. All right. Just had to tap on that real quick. Now we're going to jump off of that and move on to 1 Timothy chapter 4. All right. 1 Timothy chapter 4. And this 
is where we're going to get into the bottom line and we're going to close out on this. Now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The devil made me do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So you're sitting there watching a movie where they're having all kind of sexual stuff and their naked bodies and boobs bouncing and booties bouncing and everything shaking, rock and rolling. And you're sitting up there getting hot and bothered. Or you're on the internet. Even worse, watching those secluded spots where you can really see some detailed action going down. And you can get all turned on and you can play with yourself till the cows come home. Baby cakes, no, you're giving in to seducing spirits. Number two, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know how you know your conscience is seared with a hot iron? I'm I'm going to role play real quick. Uh, <laughs> you know, Lynn, I, I, I know you love God and, and all that, you know, but, um, you know, you need to just mind your business, girl. Because if I'm going to date this married man, I'm going to date this married man. And I don't want to hear your mouth. Every time I turn around, you on my case. Now, if you're caught up in something, but you got the Holy Spirit in you, you're going to agonize over it. It's going to cause a, a, a tug of war. Your flesh is struggling with the spirit. Spirit struggling with your flesh. There's no peace. You're not enjoying it. You're feeling bad when you give in and you're fighting it when you're being tempted. But no, when your conscience is seared with a hot iron, baby, uh, can't touch this baby. I do what I want to do. I'm three times seven. So you just hush your mouth and you go on to church. You're going to read that word. You do what you want to do. God knows me. He understands my needs. I do what I need to do and I'm, I'm fine with it. So don't you worry about me. How's that? That's a seared conscience right there. You don't want to hear it. You don't want to be bothered with God's people. You don't want to hear the word. You don't want God getting in your mess because you want your mess. Three, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meat. Some of you will commit all kinds of sin. Here's a perfect example. Let me read this whole verse. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Listen, there was a story I heard years ago to show you how people's reasoning is twisted. That's why the Bible says, lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. This man, was, this was on the news. This man had gone in this house and killed every member of the family, just brutally, brutally killed them. I mean, they were murdered. They, he committed mayhem. All kind of crap was going on. So you got blood and body parts everywhere. But he goes and he sits at the dining room table because the food was freshly put on at the time that he committed his dastardly deed. He sits there to eat the food. He eats everything, but he doesn't touch the, the meat. The meat was, I think, ham or something like that. And when, you know, they caught him, he was arrested. They asked him, why? What were you thinking? It's already crazy that you did what you did to this poor family. But then you eat up their food and you don't touch any of that meat. Why? And he says, I only eat fish on Sun on Friday. So he's sitting up there worrying about what meat he eats, but he has totally just destroyed a household and taken lives like it was nobody's business, like it was fun for him. That's how crazy people think. That's leaning to your own understanding. <laughs> okay, so, oh my goodness. Verse six, I'm jumping around real quick so we can get done. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, that thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, 
nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained, but refuse profane and old wise fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. All right. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of, of acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men, especially those who believe. These things command and teach. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and in conversation, in charity and in spirit, in faith and in purity. I mean, and in also in purity. Okay, listen. In example to the believers, in word. So your words must be seasoned with holiness and love. In conversation, that does not mean having a, a, a jaw jacking session with your buddy. Conversation in this sense, in this context, means your outward behavior, your character, how you carry yourself, your attitude, how you express yourself. In charity, that's love. In spirit, that's your whole fiber. And in faith and purity, faith and purity, the whole thing is based on faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. You have to remember, you have to remember that you are called for a purpose. You can't live your life haphazard. You can't be out there at the wicker store uh, buying candles and, and, and crystals. You can't be out there playing with Ouija boards and tarot cards, calling the psychic hotline because God is too slow bringing you an answer and you want to know if this going to be your man and this going to be your woman. Is this it? No, you better pray on that, baby, and wait on the Lord. Because when you when you consult with the occultic level, when you consult with astrology, when you consult with witchcraft, baby cakes, you are consulting with demons. Hello? Really? So all I say is, please, I caution you. Watch what you yoke up with. Do not be unequally yoked with any of that crap out there. Please don't. Don't open yourself up to demons, to demonic activity or demonic possession. Don't do that. It's the fool, most foolish thing you can do. Stay in the presence of God. Stay with him. Keep knocking and asking and crying and praying and seeking and reading until you experience him one-on-one. -on -one. You have a shown up one-on-one -on -one encounter, a manifestation of God in your life. Because let me tell you, baby cakes, you seek him to that level and God does acknowledge hunger. He shows up with a hunger heart. If you seek him like that, you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart, seek him, y'all. The most beautiful thing in life you could have in it happening for you is to experience the presence, the supernatural love, the joy, the peace of God. Nothing else compares, nowhere near. And I, I ask you to please remember who God is. Don't turn your back on him because he didn't answer the prayer you want an answer. He might have not answered that prayer for your protection not to be a killjoy. Amen? Trust him. Seek him. Live for him. And don't yoke up to anything that's opposed to him.